Um, I, I'm in the cannabis industry right now, and the cannabis industry has had a very painful lesson about regulations. There's a, there's a effect known as the butterfly effect. A butterfly flaps its wings and a hurricane is, uh, comes from some other part of the world. Well, the cannabis industry has learned the, like, the, the sledgehammer effect and multiple knives and gunshots. Like, this is like such an over-regulated industry. And Rand Paul has been championing deregulation for such a long time that I think that the cannabis yeah. industry is wide open to hearing about this from a very personal level. They take a lot of risk. And not only, it's not just cannabis. California has just pushed that freelancer law in, yeah. screwed up the whole, everybody's yeah. screwed up. It's not a Republican or a Democrat yeah. thing. No. It's people that are just trying to do things. Yes. They just want to do the thing. And they can't do the thing because there's all these things in the way. And so, why I think Rand Paul has been so incredible is that he's been pushing a, a message of liberty, which just means that we can do what we want to do as long as we don't hurt people. Correct. That's all it's about. I've been passionate about that. And it's not just liberty isn't the cause, it's that when we're unchained, we can do great things. Yeah. Beauty is the cause, creation is the cause, amazing experiences in life are the cause. Let's live great lives. We need to be free to do so. Rand Paul has been the greatest advocate I've seen of that in the Senate since the Founding Fathers. And I hope, I think he's got a real shot one day of being our president. Yay! I'll be your delegate over here. But he's very philosophical. The future of the conservative movement is very much moving libertarian. And he's on the forefront of that. He's on the forefront of the future. Yes. And I, I, I support him in a lot of ways. He's been doing a great job of getting, selling liberty to more religious people. I can't do that, I'm not religious. Alvin does a good job of selling it to more feminists. I can't do that, they are upset with all my micro gestures. <laughs> He's a great salesman to his crowd. We, we need a lot of salesmen out there selling liberty to the world because we need to do a lot of great things. And I'm really super honored to have Rand Paul here. He's gonna say a few words tonight. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Judd and Adam. Thanks for having us here. And it's a great pleasure to be here in California. And it is really shocking, though, and surprising that the government could screw up even freedom for cannabis, right? right. So, uh, but we have to be careful. I mean, there, there's been great progress in the industry, but you know, now the federal government's looking at it, how we actually get something that works. There is a, a, a great deal of... Uh, chance that uh, they screw it up, like everything else the government gets their hands on. Y'all met my wife, many of you, Kelly oh. Paul. <laughs> so I think that one of the things I look for, and one of the reasons I continue to be part of this, is that you look at what you get, and you, you have so many people, you get elected, and then you're unhappy, they don't do what you ask them to do. And then there just aren't many people that sort of fit the bill of sort of what a libertarian is. Economically conservative, but on the other half, you do whatever you want, Judd, as long as you don't hurt somebody. Where do you get? Don't <laughs> But the thing is, is there isn't that much of it, particularly on a war. I mean, we have so many people that are pretty good on some issues, and on war they're terrible. And so to me, I think that's one of the most important issues, that we have somebody trying to end the endless wars. You know, we've been in war too long in too many places. We've got people on the right and the left sometimes coming together. People say, well, everybody hates each other in Washington. There is no compromise. There actually is some work together on the war issue. You yes. know, Bernie Sanders' book, we blast Bernie a lot for socialism. But at the same time, we have a couple of paragraphs in there that we do work together on issues of war. I'm working with Tim Gaines now, saying we shouldn't be at war. But there's also some things that, you know, I try my best, even with the president. I know there'll be some people here who don't like the president. But at the same time, some of his instincts are good, and I try to get the best I can possibly get. You're doing a good job. So on the Iran thing, I was very worried that the killing of the general would escalate into war. I was afraid Iran would launch missiles, 100 Marines would die, and we'd be at war. Fortunately, that didn't happen. I'm, I'm not positive it still might not, that their, their thirst for revenge will not be 
sated by what's happened so far, so I am still concerned with that. But if we were to escalate, and all of a sudden there is a war, which I don't want there to be a war, there has to be a vote. We can't just let one person take us to war. Even a person, if you're a Republican, you like them, and I am a Republican, and I work with him, we can't let one person take us to war. surveillance. You know, when I ran the presidential campaign, you heard me talking about, you know, we don't want the government listening to our phone calls. We don't want the government, we say reading our mail, but you don't have no idea what I was talking about. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the old, the old fashioned used to send these things to the mail and they wouldn't have them. <laughs> but the thing is, is we don't want the government involved in our, our communications with each other. We don't want the government involved with, you know, whether we search free market economics or whatever you search in here. But the thing is, we don't want the government involved in that. And one of the things that's come out of this, no matter what your position is on the president, is that the surveillance state has too much power. And this is the only thing that gets me sometimes, because I'll run into libertarians and they, they hate Trump so much they don't realize that this is an opportunity for us to try to put a stranglehold on the, on the surveillance state. We always believed that before Trump was. And if, you, if people dislike Trump, why can't they still understand that there's a libertarian principle to put you know, chains on the, on the intelligence community so they can't spy on us, they can't do this. And so I think it's a real opportunity. In the next month, I'll be introducing legislation that says you can't look at any of these FISA databases without a warrant from a regular judge. Yeah. Even if you look at it, you can't do it. There's two problems with this. You could get people on the bias from the right or the left who could look in the database. If you're an international business man or woman, I talked to Tim Cook last week. How many people do you think Tim Cook talks to overseas? This is a gigantic company with businesses everywhere. He probably talks to someone in a foreign country every week. Should we be allowed to listen to his phone calls? Should we be allowed to monitor his phone data without a warrant? No, we absolutely, you deserve that privacy. The way the surveillance state works now, that even under President Obama, there was like 1,500 phone calls where they're, they're listening to President Obama. They say, oh, he's masked. Well, you think you can't tell it's him? You know, talking to another world leader, we shouldn't be listening to these phone calls. So this is an opportunity. And I can tell you that people come up to me on the Republican side, there's only sort of two libertarian leaning that are for privacy. It's Mike Lee and I. There's a few who might get on a few other things, but really, it's Mike Lee and I. And so I can't tell you how many times people came up to me and they said, you and Mike were right. People were coming up to me who had always voted against us, you know, and uh, we're not reporting. So, you know, I was going to say, Devin Nunes is from out here. He'd have been on the other side of this coin. But then once Adam Schiff revealed Devin Nunes' phone calls, he's like, damn, this should be doing that. <laughs> <laughs> but it takes a little bit of all of a sudden when it's used, it becomes more profound. So, what we have now is Republicans who are terrible on the surveillance state actually are now saying, you guys were right. You know, we trusted the FBI, and it turns out, guess what? Sometimes there are some bad apples in the FBI. But to my mind, it's important to know that what they gather through the FISA intelligence court on foreign intelligence, people who might attack us, is not gathered under the Constitution. It's gathered under a, keep watching my footsteps here. It's gathered under probable cause of whether or not you might be related to a foreign country, not probable cause that you committed a crime. So any of this data, even if they did look at it, should never be used in domestic crime. Think about it. Cannabis is legal out here, but it's not in Kentucky. What if somebody made an international phone call for another reason, and they are spying on it because they think you might be involved in terrorism? You're not, but they understand you're in the cannabis industry and it's illegal in your particular state. Should we be using that information to prosecute domestic crime? I think absolutely never. And it was really, really dry and boring, and then Kelly helped me make it. <laughs> and uh, it actually is a, it's a really good book, and it covers a lot of ground. And when I tell people we wrote a book, The Case Against Socialism, they're like, really? We have to restate the case against socialism? Yeah. 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 But I think we do. Every generation kind of has to do this. And it's really part of the battle that we all have, and it's the battle of sort of defending what our country was founded on, because other people will come to you from the left and they'll say, I'll give you something. I'll give you a free phone, or a free car, or a free college. And instinctively, you should know there really is no such thing as a free lunch, right? But the thing is, it's, 
easy to succumb to that. Most of you won't, all of us won't, but there are people out there that will succumb to something for nothing. They will come, succumb to something for free. And so how do we combat that? Because what we're offering is something intangible. What we're offering people is opportunity, the opportunity to get ahead in life, the opportunity to work. And I think the thing about it, that if you go deep enough into this, John Allison is really good at this. He used to be the head of Cato, talking about self-esteem. And it's like, you know, I'd attach work to all government programs. I wouldn't let anybody get a penny without work if they were able to. <laughs> And that'd be 99% of people taking stuff from government. But I would attach work not because I want to punish people, but because I think work's how you get your self-esteem. I don't care what your job is. Whatever you do, you can only earn your own self-esteem by working and by doing something and feeling good about it. Yeah. No one can give it to you. And that's part of the problem of our society. It's part of the problem of our school. Not only do they teach you to get something for nothing, Johnny should get a trophy with her. He can run faster than I, and Susie, she can't spell worth the crap. <laughs> we still should we let her win this stuff. Nobody should really win the spelling bee, and it's how unfair is that? To let people who spell better win the bee. And so it's all about this equality thing and fairness, but I think that's where the push for socialism comes. Because when you see these polls, it's like over half of the young people, they say, well, socialism, man, we should give it a try, man. It's about fairness, it's about justice, and everybody will be equal. But they really don't quite understand exactly what they're asking for. <coughs> and if you poll young people, over half of them want socialism, but only about 10% actually know what socialism is. Mm -hmm. but if, you look yeah. at, if you look at AOC and Mika Bernie, the Democratic Socialists of America, they're dressing it up. They're putting you know, pretty clothes on something really awful. And uh, they're, they're talking about a kinder jet for socialism. But if you look closely at what they have very softly put on their website, it ultimately says that the government's gonna to have to own certain industries. But they don't quite explain how, if you already own that industry, how's the government gonna get it from? They may come and ask, and some people will submit, and then it gets harsher, and some people submit, and then ultimately there are people who won't give up their house, won't give up their land, won't give up their property, and then you got the gulag. And they're like, no, no, we don't want the gulag, we don't want the camps, we don't want the Holocaust, we don't want all that, we just want a kinder, gentler socialism. One of the things that I think we need, and I think it's important if you're trying to convince other young people, is that when you talk to them, people have come to understand, and some of this took us a while as a country, the concept of equal protection. What does that mean? We're all the same under the law. No matter the color of your skin, your gender, your sexuality, it doesn't matter what you are, you're treated the same under the law. That's equal protection. But think about what socialism does. Socialism says if I give you all $1,000 and you leave, Probably in 10 minutes you come back and somebody's got 1,500 and somebody's got 500 because you'll start trading. Somebody, I know somebody in this group's got cannabis and you'll buy it. <laughs> <laughs> so they've got your money and you've got the cannabis. But no, the thing is, is a week you come back, a month you come back and the money's been redistributed. And it's like, well, if I want to make you equal again, if I want to, it's all about equality and socialism, how do I make you equal? Only by treating you unequally. So if we believe in this great concept of equal protection under the law that everybody's treated equally, you can't have a quality of outcome because if you have a quality of outcome, I have to treat you unequally. And I think it's a way of capturing the young people's desire for justice and equality and fairness and say, well, guess what? Socialism isn't fair. Life isn't fair in general, but at least the top 1% in capitalism is about merit, at least to a certain extent. The top 1% in Cuba or Venezuela is about being close to the leader, being the brother of the leader, being a brother of the general. There are people in, in Venezuela who've gotten bigger, but the average person in Venezuela has lost 20 pounds over the last year. It's desperate. So in the book we write about this, and we try to combat some of the things that uh, you know Bernie promotes about you know, socialism, kinder, gentler socialism. And this is a part of the book that Kelly worked on a lot, was uh, talking about and comparing the Scandinavia, because that's their big thing. <coughs> This is where I get to rest, and Kelly's going to come get on and say, you
And it's sort of a misnomer that they're socialist countries. First of all, we dispute that in the book. And they're not socialist, as a matter of fact. The Prime Minister of Denmark actually told Bernie, please stop calling us a socialist country. We have nothing but capitalism here. It's like Cato and Franklin. They're very free places to do business. The idea that they're socialists really came about because in the 1970s, they did work heavily with socialist policies. But what happened? The wealthy fled. Um, in Sweden, for example, the founder of IKEA left, Bjorn Borg left. They started to lose their 